Wishing you a lovely and good morning. A warm hello to all the attendees, guests, and friends. I hope you are feeling good as, and excited as I am. It is a great pleasure for me to declare the International Symposium open today. This symposium is a part of a bigger four-year-long project about the contextualization of fashion, which is based in four content sections, identity of fashion, fashion in art, education in fashion system, and fashionista, Slovenian fashion. First, I would like to thank and welcome the initiator of the symposium and program manager, Associate Professor Tanya Devetak, for such a hard work, effort, and whole organization. I would also like to thank the scientific committee, Assistant Professor Dr. Ivana Bakal, Assistant Professor Dr. Marina Kucareva Ranisaulio, and Associate Professor Dr. Damiana Cilca. Today's discussion topics, with the general title Identity, Fashion at Crossroads, will be related to the contextualization of fashion in forms of fashion and social, geographical, economic, political, historical, environmental, and cultural contexts. Discussion topics will be discussed with the forms of appearance of identity in fashion, such as sexual, social, production, professional, national, political, media, business, and sustainability. Identity and dress are intimately linked. Clothes display, express, and shape identity. They give us a sense of security in presenting ourselves in society. It also gives us power to present ourselves with identity we want. But before I turn over the conference to the first part of presentations, I would like to kindly ask uh, Mr. Nate Aubel, Deputy Director of Museum of Architecture and Design uh, in Ljubljana, the host of today's symposium in this wonderful ambience, to say a few words. Thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished guests, lecturers, and everybody on the other side of the cameras and screens, welcome to Mao. Museum of Architecture and Design is quite a young institution. This year we are celebrating 50 years of our beginnings. And our museum is dedicated to the fields of architecture, industrial design, graphic design and architectural photography. So I can say that the fashion is a little bit outside of our regular scope. However, with our projects as Biennale of Design and especially Center for Creativity, which is a support hub for all creative industries, including fashion, we are trying to regularly tackle also with the fields of fashion and to consider design in its broadest meaning. Uh, I am especially happy that events as such, a symposium identity in fashion happen in our museum because they somehow complement our basic dedication, our basic fields of research and they make our program more, uh, how would I say, broad, more interesting, more open. So I wish you a fruitful day, full of good lectures and discussions, and I hope it will be also a meaningful day with a good conclusion. Uh, besides that, I would also like to invite everybody to the exhibition in the upper floor of our museum. It's exhibition about architect Jozef Plechnik. We have opened it only three weeks ago and uh, for now it is a very successful exhibition. So I'm sure you will uh, take a look at it and have a few minutes or maybe even hours with architect Jozef Plechnik. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you very much for this warm welcome and introduction to this symposium. Before we start, I would like to give some instructions. Each participant has 10 minutes for their presentation. I will ring at this bell once, two minutes before the end. So it would be a very gentle reminder. And then we will have a 10 minute discussion. 
I would like to start the symposium with our first presentation by Associative Professor Dr. Sonja Sterman from the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in the University of Maribor, Slovenia. Associate Professor PhD Sonja Sterman is employed at the University of Maribor Faculty of Mechanical Engineering Institute of Design and is the head of the Laboratory for Engineering Design of Product Design. She holds and teaches courses related to fashion, textiles, accessory, and product design. Her special area of interest is in the theory of sustainable and multifunctional design. Before her academic career, she worked as a fashion designer for the companies Mura, Rashica, and Elos Escada. She also specializes in the design of uniforms for companies, societies, and ministries. Her contribution to this symposium is titled Communication and Identity of Uniforms for Employees in Public Service, Industry, and Tourism. Welcome. professors, the students, dear guests. I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, uh, we will go through very quickly through self-definition, identity, corporate identity, and then we will see uniforms in different uh, contexts. Um, of course, uh, we will touch communication identity of uniforms, and then we will see through a few groups of uniforms uh, that identity relates a lot. And um, today uh, we, we are all uh, expressing ourselves with what we are wearing. We can change our clothes every day and adapt clothing related to what we do, where we go. Um, so that uh, definition of personality can be emphasized and reinforced with our outfits. But what happens if people working in uniforms? They couldn't do that. They have to wear um, and uh, wear also clothing and hairdressing and makeup um, um, in the way as uh, the company said. So uh, uniform overshadowed their personal identity. And so can you imagine how they feel, they, they couldn't express uh, their own personality in the way we can do with our clothes. And uh, uh, preparing that lecture, I, I just uh, ask questions. Did you ever happen to you that somewhere in the, in the street was very common to you and you didn't know where you saw him before? Probably you saw him in some uniforms. So you know maybe, uh, this person here on the picture, do you know her? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, but for sure you know her in that uniform, in sport uniform representing Slovenia more. So in the case when people are uniformed, the personality is covered with the building blocks of the identity of the company, uh, club, school, and that person represents uh, in the particular workplace. And uh, if uh, we try to understand um, uniforms, what kind of relation people has to uniform people, 28% of people ask can more easily identify workers that are uh, dressed in uniforms. And also 61% of them think that employees in uniforms have more confidence in their ability to do their jobs. And also, people think that products are better if they are served by people who are dressed in uniforms. And also, 55% of us trust employees in uniforms more than if they are not in uniform. And also, people are more comfortable to ask about explaining purchase questions uh, for employees that is in uniform. So we can see uniform has very strong identity. And as Bill Dunn said, it seems as though the modern world loves uniforms. 
Uh, we can see uniforms in different contexts. One is uniform related to history. We all know um, a lot of details that are like natural today that seems, oh, this is uniform, comes out from the history. And we can see um, here uh, uniform, uh, the firms I, <laughs> It first is, uh, of course, uniform as functional and comfortable and multi-combinatory uh, comp clothing system uh, that has to cover different um, types of uniforms uh, for working, for ceremony, and for many different purposes. And of course, when uh, we see uniforms, we have to know if that is the big group with size 6,000 employees like police, uh, men or uh, we design for a very small group of uniforms. Here we have different users, different sizes, different uh, long uh, age and sex. So uh, uh, another con context, as I said, is uh, related to history and as uniforms as system of science. Here we can see from the picture different bands, uh, uh, metal buttons, uh, epaulets, different pockets. Uh, when we see clothing today that has these elements, we, uh, we just think about um, that these details are um, uh, known for uniforms. And, uh, of course, uniform we can see also related to fashion. Uh, so the style of uniforms is used as silhouette and in the form of details that define the uniform. Uh, we can see also a lot of casual clothing that has those kind of details. And of course, uh, uniform as uh, style and belonging to a group are very strong. We all know different groups, punkers, and different uh, um, groups that, uh, as a sign of belonging to that group, uh, uniforms or their clothing has um, a big power. Uh, we can see uniform also as a form of communication. Uh, we can talk here about ideology of uniforms. So meaning of uniform is to show belonging to the group and uniforms make that group powerful. In fashion, we can follow the functional and ideological values that build a recognizable style. So today's typical details of uniform um, such as metal buttons, epaulets, uh, wadgets, and other details, uh, over the time come to denote status and are elements that we have become used to, to point that we take them for granted in uniform design. And uh, we can uh, understand uniforms uh, in different relations. So in the organization and out of society. So in the organization, we know position of the person and out of um, in society, we can know what uh, can we expect from the person. Um, and in research, um, there are a lot of different articles that shows uh, uniform, how it influence to the person who wear uniform because they have another behavior in style of uniform and also how people react to uniformed people and how they influence to the um, society. And uh, uniformed person contribute to the identity of recognition of the company. Um, they are all the time exposed to the uh, reaction of society, and the garment shows what we can expect from a person. When you come to the hospital, we immediately know who is doctor, who is the nurse, who, who are ill people, or who are just visitors, because their clothes says about their position, and also what we can expect from those people. 
And if we see quickly public workers, they're, they're, this is a big group of very different um, um, groups. Uh, some of them work inside, some of them outside. Here are all uh, repressive identities, doctors, uh, firemen, drivers. So really a lot of different groups that have a lot of different requirements. I make one uh, research in related to repressive authorities, police, custom, and justice, so for people who wear um, guns also. So I make a survey what is important for uniforms for that group. And if one is not important, at 10 is very important, then you can see that quality and features and functionality of clothing is very high noted. And then it's important price and suppliers, because if we have big group of uniforms, suppliers are very important for continuation of fabrics. And then is communication power of uniform. And uh, for some other, for example, for tourism, we know it is very important how they express, and this communication power is much higher. So for industrial workers, we could see very different um, groups of people. Everyone has to adapt uh, to work um, places. And of course, tourism workers, uh, they have to feel uh, also comfortable in their uniforms, but they have to represent place or country uh, that they represent. And uh, I just will show you a case study, my design of uniforms for uh, Spirit Slovenia for Expo Milano 2015. I uh, think about these two sentences, feeding the planet, energy for life, promotional title of Expo Milano and Slovenian promotional title, I feel Slovenia Green Active Healthy. So I designed, I translate these promotional titles into design. And I was quite limited with colors, but I tried to put something of each word. So you can see that design and also some pictures of this um, um, Expo Milano um, place. And um, I think uh, the, the best um, thanks to the, the designer is if they said we loved that uniform and we wanted to wear and we were happy to represent Slovenia in those clothing. So, uh, just for the end, I would like to uh, express, because here is a lot of uh, young designers, I just want to say, when designing, we have to know what is the company identity. And each designer should translate their wishes into visual language. So, what does the company want to communicate through clothing? How do we translate wishes into design? what lines, colors, silhouettes, shapes, and details can represent their wishes. And of course, which materials uh, will be um, um, good for uh, their working conditions and also uh, cuts. So if I conclude with last sentence, to design uniform is to protect users and transfer visual language into corporate identity. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you also, Tanya. Thank you. And please welcome me for a little chat. So clothing can hold so much power. But how much power does a uniform have? It works. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I think uniform has very a huge, very big power. Uh, because uh, as you see through examples, uh, the power of group that one belongs, uh, it goes over personal 
uh, power of uh, each person. So if we want to reach the power of the group, that must be uniform. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> by wearing corporate or uniform clothing, personal identity, as you said, overrides and becomes professional identity. Can we separate those two meanings? Is it hard to separate those two? Yes, I think it's very, very hard to separate both because uh, if, if we see every person in, in the same uniformed group, everyone has another energy, personal energy. So we, we couldn't see like one, they have some um, another energy to the, to the group. But if we see them standing as a group, they have very big power of, of, uh, of the group. Mm -hmm. And I think it is not possible to separate uh, this. Yes. Uh, uniforms help promote a sense of community and common identity. They help us identify professionals in different fields and they help businesses create salient brands. Well-designed uniforms are not only functional, but encourage people to feel like a part of a group, as you said, with a common purpose. How powerful is psychological impact of uniform to the wearer? Uh, yes, it is a lot of studies that shows that uniforms have uh, big power. So, uh, if we change the style of uniform, for example, jacket or military style of jacket, uh, the psychological feeling is al already different. Yeah. And uh, if we change color, uh, black and blue, it, they are j very near, but mm -hmm. it is already a big difference. Mm -hmm. For example, blue uh, shows uh, that person is more open uh, to be asked some questions. And black is just um, have a barrier between mm -hmm. people. So well, I hope I don't <laughs> have today <coughs> this no, barrier. <laughs> uh, I think this <coughs> black in the fashion world is is in another context. Mm -hmm. But if we see uniform, for example, policemen in black or in blue, mm -hmm. um, um, the survey uh, shows that uh, people ask easily. Uh, a uniform person in blue mm -hmm. than in black. Than in black. Uh, but authority, if we would like to m make and build a strong authority, then black is the one. For mm -hmm. example, if we stay at the area of police uniform, special forces will have black. Yeah. And uh, policemen that helps us uh, in everyday life, they yeah. have blue. Okay. Uh, but some of them abuse this power of uniform. So where is the line? Yes, I think that through history, some people abused their position. Yeah. It was, and I hope that one day we finish with that behavior. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, if every person do on to becoming everyday better person, then also this maybe <laughs> will happen once that yeah. they, they will realize that we just have to do good yeah. in uniform or, or without. without. Yeah. Um, in recent decades, various military styles in particular have begun to influence fashion, as we've seen before, which expresses a different meaning and function. Uh, for example, in the 60s, Yves Saint Laurent designed the famous button-down jacket and influenced the military-inspired clothing of other designers such as Balmain, Givenchy, Prada, Burberry, and so on. What does this mean for the status and the power of the uniforms? Um, yeah, I think that this jacket, as, as you exposed, we have jackets now in, in, in fashion, in uniforms, it's everywhere. But in fashion, it could adapt to trends quicklier. Mm -hmm. It is similar from year to year, but it can adapt in some small details. Maybe buttons difference is different. Maybe length of the model is different or just shape. But in uniforms, it stays there for longer time. Mm -hmm. Because if we 
were a group of a lot of people. Uh, we couldn't change and replace every year with new style. Mm -hmm. We have uniform for maybe 15 years the same, or just slightly um, um, modernized, but mm -hmm. they, uh, they couldn't change for so many people uniforms in, in one year. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it is, it is still different. Yeah. Uh, what about school uniforms? <clears throat> school uniforms are believed to be a practice which dates to the 16th century in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> Proponents say that <clears throat> school uniforms make schools safer for students, create a level playing field that reduces social economic disparities, and encourage children to focus on their studies rather than their clothes. Opponents students' right to express their individuality, have no positive effect on behavior and academic achievement, and have emphasized the social economic disparities they are intended to disguise. So what is your opinion about that? Should we promote personal identity by younger generations, or it would be easier with collective identity? I think we, we have to uh, build the possibility to express personal identity. I think that Everywhere is already a direction to be uh, unitized. So I think we, we have supported their personality. Yeah. I, I was asked similar questions already. If I support uniforms in, in society, in, in schools or not, I was always not to have uniforms. Yeah. But uh, a friend of mine, she had children in the kindergarten with, with some uniforms. She said, oh, it's so easily. I don't need to think what to, to wear mm -hmm. next day. Mm -hmm. So there are pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's, it's fine to support uh, this, um, especially if by young generation, mm -hmm. that they are open to colors, to, to different styles, that mm -hmm. they discover their own style also. Yeah. And also that they have a freedom. Yeah, so. and they, yeah. that they have freedom, yeah. Thank you very much for this lovely conversation on such an interesting topic and wishing you all the best on your professional path. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you very much and thank you to invite me. Yeah. Now I would like to welcome the second participant of today's symposium, <clears throat> Assistant Professor Magister Dela Ramic, who will present us with the theme of migration and cultural identity. Uh, assistant Professor Magister Dela Ramic is employed in the position of Assistant Professor at the Technical Faculty of University of Bihać in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2016. From 2018 to 2022, she is the head of the textile department of the Technical Faculty in Bihać. In 2021, she enrolled in the interdisciplinary doctoral study Modern Production Technologies at the Technical Faculty in Bihać. Uh, she is the coordinator of annual student fashion shows and workshops as a part of art courses. And from September 2022, she is acting as a local coordinator of the CIPUS network. Uh, and she actively also particip participates in the projects of the International Organization for Migration, IOM. Dela Ramic will present her contribution with the title Migration and Cultural Identity. Please. Thank you, Maya. Um, one of the most visible and universal ways that people express themselves is through clothing. Clothing conveys information about in, an individual personality group, membership, and even in the context of social situations. Research suggests that clothing is the part of dynamic social process linked to ethnic identity, religious identity, and self-esteem. The Zmiany design project was created as a need to preserve the integrable cultural heritage of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also as a need of, uh, for the cultural identity of the early, early emergency of a new generation of actors in migration process, such as the third generation of migrants from these areas. Uh, members of the third generation of migrants show an interest in the culture of their parents' identity, searching for their origin and sense of belonging, uh, but also for the most important thing that marks them. Uh, the approach to this project is based on the inspiration of Snake Connection, uh, which is included in UNESCO list of integrable cultural heritage. 
by integrating the motif of snake embroidery into in contemporary clothing uh, and the, uh, the constructing elements of fall costume. The, the students of textile department of technical faculty in Biatch created a collection uh, that clearly shows ethnicity, but also the use of traditional sign in contemporary uh, uh, context. Uh, cultural heritage uh, is of great importance due to its multiplicity, which is possessed on several levels. It is the barrier of the identity of a certain human community. And at the same time, it proves and shows the historical extent of some human communities in certain area. Of course, uh, cultural heritage uh, bears the characteristic of the past times, but it also bears the characteristic of modernity. Uh, fashion and clothing are one of the ways in which people want to preserve their inner freedom and identity uh, in the conditions of increasing global and oppression. The concept of identity implies an answer to the question of who I am, who I want to be, and or who I could possibly be. Uh. Migrants uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina today represent one of the most numerous immigrants communities from the territory of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, the, very, uh, the very arrival of the first generation of migrants in a new environment and complete abandonment of the previous norms and social system is not simple. The transition from the socialist system to the capitalist state is ignorance of the language, uh, laws, costumes, and habits made, in, uh, made it difficult for them to integrate more deeply into society itself. For second generation migrants, the ad adaptation process wasn't adapted. Uh, nor was the degree of the integration into the host society. The third generation of migrants, thanks to the sacrifice of their parents, enjoyed the value occurred in the, in the culture of the host country, but at the same time uh, show interest in the culture of their parents and uh, searching for their origin and identity. We can also see an example of highlighting ethnic affiliation through clothing in other minorities which they use to express their affiliation. The traditional embroidery from Zmijanje design was inscribed as an integral world heritage on the UNESCO list of integral world heritage in Europe of November uh, 2014 in Paris. Uh, the Zmijanje design uh, or snake connection includes respect for diversity, creativity, and nonverbal communication. It also has sentimental and emotional value, especially for displayed population who use embroidery dresses and expression of national, of national and local identity and pride. Embroidery ties together many elements of cultural heritage, such as the music, rituals, oral tradition, handicrafts, and symbolism. Uh, lectures and workshop in Bihać and Mandaluka. Uh, in Magnarium Studio, uh, a design and art studio from Mandaluka, led by architect and designer Aleksandar Vjanković, is acti actively working on the project Zmijanje Design, which reinterprets uh, re the heritage of Zmijanje weaving. Uh, from December 20, uh, 2021, the Department of Textile and the uh, Magnarium Studio are conducting joint activities on the mentioned project. The students uh, were presented with the methods and techniques of creating a clothing collection inspired by cultural heritage. During the clothing, does, uh, clothing uh, design project one course, the students worked on conceptual design solutions, after which models were selected for production and uh, marketing on the commercial market. Mm -hmm. On workshop, we work uh, on activities in field of preservation of Zmijanje, uh, creation of zero waste brand Zmijanje design, uh, market target group migrations, uh, the need to preserve traditional value, uh, the need to pass on the knowledge of the serpent connection, uh, the need for cultural identification, And after that, we have planned uh, and program a workshop through the design process, getting to know the relationship and its reinterpretation into a modern concept, 
familiarization with materials for students for their mini collection, uh, target group research, development of an idea from a fashion drawing to a technical drawing and technical documentation, construction and model making, presentation of works at the faculty, and uh, finally fashion show and exhibition in Bihać and Banja uh, these are pictures from a workshop in, on our university in Bihać. This is our final product from, uh, for uh, Zmiany Design. And these are student works from University Bihać. Uh, these are pictures from exhibition in Banja Luka. And after that in Bihać. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so would you please join me for a little chat? Um, the term authentic contemporary heritage is now then very often used. Is this necessary to preserve <clears throat> the heritage, especially for younger generations? It must be something modern, something contemporary. So is this um, very important? I will speak in Bosnian. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, jako, je, uh, jako je bitno za sve generacije, prvenstveno one koje su migrirale i koje u principu traže ovaj, pored muzike, pored, ovaj, pored uh, tih nekih drugih elemenata da na neki način ovaj, u, svoj, uh, uh, u svoj sadržaj, u svoj život uključe nešto što je tradicionalno, ali isto tako i na neki način savremeno. Uh, prvenstveno zato uvijek vežemo nekako odjeću, jer odjeća ovaj, je, ipak nosi određene poruke, ove, a sa tim malim detaljima koje smo povezali zmijanje i neki savremeni koncept, uh, jednostavno dolazimo do uh, ciljne grupe koja u stvari i traži ovaj, takav način za izražavanje. Uh, nije nastalo ništa... Uh, spontano, nego smo prvenstveno na osnovu istraživanja uh, populacije uh -huh. uh, treće migracije uh, pokušali da napravimo znači, modele koji će odgovarati znači, na komercijalnom tržištu i koji će se na neki način prodavati znači, najviše u Banja Luci. Uh -huh. <coughs> She said that this uh, contemporary heritage term is very important nowadays, especially for migrants. Of course. And fashion is so fluently and, and so well um, accepted also in the younger generations and this is a tool of communication, so it's very important to, to wear this heritage in a, in a of sense course. of comparative um, fashion. Zmijanje um, <clears throat> uh, embroidery is a specific technique practiced by the women of Zmijanje villages in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the main characteristic is the use of a thread in deep blue color, uh, handmade with vegetable dyes to embroider improv improvised geometrical shapes. Which dye is used and what, to do, um, what do the geometrical shapes represent? Did you use also uh, the blue color or it was black? Krenčem iz početka. Prvenstveno zmijanje je prvenstveno bilo u crnoj boji. Znači, prvo se koristila crna boja koja se ovaj, znači, godinama koristila kao tradicionalni znak za zmijanje vez, prvenstveno zato što smo je dobili prirodnim putem od kuhanja samog jasena. Znači, mala domaćinstva u određenim periodima nisu imali druge mogućnosti, nego se radilo sve znači, prirodnim putem, znači prirodnim bojalima. Sve do momenta dok austro-ugarska vojska nije došla na ovaj, to područje, ona je sa svojim dolaskom i 
donijela znači crnu boju, plavu boju. Plavu boju koja je znači korištena za uniforme samih vojnika, a onda su se posle znači i žene koje su s područja Banja Luke znači koristile u zmijanju. Tako da u principu ta plava je boja dosta onako novija nego ta crna. Da, 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 da ću prevesti ih ovo. Što se tiče geometrijskih elementa, geometrijski elementi su već dugi niz godina na tom području korišteni u više varijanti, ne samo kroz zmijanje, nego su oni već od samog neolita nekako iskorišteni da bi se u principu slagala ta geometrija. Podobno iz sveta geometrija. Da. The color blue... Um, she said that uh, first was the black, black color and uh, that was before the Austro-Hungarian uh, Austro uh, uh, Hungarians came to this area uh, with uh, their uniforms. There were all sorts of colors, bright colors and also blue. Yes. And the influence of blue color through these uh, uniforms uh, were adopted, yes, adopted as in blue. Uh, so this geometry is uh, from Neolithic, um, Neolithic. area, and um, it's still it's still very fashionable. It's still very yes, it's pleasant to the eye and to the soul, yeah. you know, because like symmetry is yeah, yes, geometry. Symmetry. Yeah. Um, Zbijanje embroidery is described in 2014 on the representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. What attitude do young people, especially students, your students, have towards heritage and how important is heritage in a contemporary context for younger generations? How students of the textile department of the technical faculty in Bihać went about researching and designing their creations? Did they feel this expression of national and local identity and pride? A tu je jedan mali problem. Bosna je podijeljena u više dijelova. Tako da u principu studenti univerziteta u Bihaću su radili nešto što pripada, mislim, nacionalno pripada Republici Srpskoj. U principu ovo je bila samo jedna saradnja gdje smo na neki način pokušali da izradimo određeni odnosi između različitih ustanova, između privatne ustanove kao što je Imaginarium Studio i Tajničkog fakulteta u Bihaću, posebno dizajna, gdje smo na način da kao i sve projekte koje smo do sada radili, u principu krenuli sa onim najjednostavnijim procesom, a to je u stvari dizajniranjem određenih elemenata, gdje je u stvari sva ta priča oko zmijanja i dizajn na neki način ima već kroz par mjeseci rada sa njima i sa upoznavanjem svih tih elemenata je bila dosta zanimljiva. Tako da u principu počeli su da radi na drugim projektima koji su na neki način više vezani, na primjer, za tradicionalne bosanske čilime i koji se isto vežu za geometriju, prvenstveno za geometriju, a onda za floralni dizajn. Tako da je to bio jedan dobar uvod u stvari upoznavanje određenog identiteta, znači određenih manjina, jer sve na neki način su to manjine koje u stvari čine određenu grupu koja u stvari stvara te elemente, a koje mi uzimamo kao svoj identitet. So it was very difficult to identify uh, with students uh, for this local Zmiljanja um, um, yeah. design uh, because the Bosnia and Herzegovina is parted in different ethnical areas and this was so very difficult for young students. And the research was mainly focused on the geometrical yeah. shapes in which they researched and then in component in, yeah, in, in fashion. In fashion. Um, so, as you said, Imaginarian Studio and the Taxile Department um, have been collaborating on the Zmijanje Design Project since December 2021. Um, and Zmijanje Design Collection by Imaginarian Studio was introduced in the fashion show at the Citadela Plateau in the very heart of the city of Banja Luka. I saw the video, yes. it's so modern and so great. But without the audience during the strict COVID-19 restriction period under the police supervision. This was the pioneering venture in the whole region of Balkans. Uh, what was the reaction of the society about that? Your students did also fashion show in the heart of the streets of um, Bihać. Yeah. 
And how is it different to have a fashion show uh, inside or outside? Absolutely the same. Just that the process is different when it's a question of the audience who is in fact living in it as their own and something that they did students in the textile process. E sada ove stvari bile da se naprave određeni modeli koji će na neki način zadovoljiti određenu publiku. Tako da u principu ta modna revija koja se desila u Banjoj Luci, koja je prezentirala te iste radove i imala puno većeg odjeka kod same publike, jer je upravo bila i namijenjena toj publici. Znači treća generacija koja dolazi kod svojih djedova, baka, koja dođe jednom godišnjem da posjeti svoje porodice, na neki način je upoznavala nešto čim želi da se na neki način ih poveže, a to je u principu pored muzike, pored običaja, pored kola, svakako i izmijanje. Um, traditionally, uh, Zmian and Brotherin is used to decorate female costumes and household items, including wedding dresses, scarves, garments, bed linen. Contemporary art included the integration of these specific motifs in fashion clothing and also in jewelry, for example, Dukan Nakit from Sarajevo. How important is a brand and a good marketing of a brand, especially on the topic of heritage nowadays? <laughs> Danas se ove mnoge stvari ovise o tome, ali je super što na neki način možemo dobiti jako puno informacija od samog brenda, jer prodajom, marketingom, ciljnim populacijama u stvari imamo puno više informacija kako bi na neki način kreirali određene predmete. So it is very important to have a yes, good brand, course. to have a good marketing, to have a great photos also da. of the brand and design. So... Um, Thank you very much Thank for you. this pleasant conversation and wishing you also um, uh, all good on your professional path. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome the third participant of the first part of today's symposium, Associate Professor Tanya Devetak. She will present the topic of Fashionista, National Fashion Identity in Context of Space. Tanya Devetak is an associate professor in the field of clothing and textile design. She is an external lecturer at the Faculty of Design, an independent higher education institution. She has received international awards for her work in regular exhibits at solo and group exhibitions. She works as an independent researcher at the Center of Design Research in the field of the history of Slovenian fashion, decolonization of fashion, and the sustainable context of the fashion system. She participates in projects that are part of a wider contemporary design context. She is currently finishing her doctoral studies at the University of Ljubljana. Tanja Develtag will present her contribution on the theme Fashionista, National Fashion Identity in Context of Space. Tanya, welcome. Good morning, everyone, and it's good to see you here and also online. I will be presenting, um, in my own words, uh, the national identity that has emerged in Slovenia, and I called it Fashionista, and I will talk it through uh, the building of Fashionista in the context of space, which I think it's a very important um, um, uh, supposition for the fashion, as it, as it, uh, it, is it equal also to the body and to the time. But um, why uh, actually we are talking about space? So the space is not uh, uh, only the, um, the physical space in which we move, we can feel it, we have some kind of a connection towards our bodies, uh, but it's also uh, um, the space uh, which we cannot touch, but we uh, have the notion of it in the context of, uh, in the social context, in geographic context, economic context, historical context, environmental context, and cultural context. I will explain uh, shortly in my presentation um, what uh, I was thinking uh, by that, but in shortly, this abstract value of, um, of space, um, according to the fashion, uh, is, um, embedded in uh, relationships that we as individuals 
also um, make an interaction with the society in which we are, um, are placed or we live in or we, we are part of uh, the communities. So um, building the fashionista um, in Slovenian national identity uh, started many decades ago um, um, first through um, the social context. As was mentioned before, um, the system that we were living in, of course, was very um, strongly uh, connected with the different uh, social stratas and also um, uh, it was the, the, uh, the, the focal point of the whole system um, um, how to say, um, formation. Uh, in that sense, of course, Slovenian fashion identity has started to build up uh, in the early um, in, uh, 70s uh, with uh, some, um, some, um, some uh, starting points in the eight, uh, late uh, 60s. Because at that time, first of first fashion designers emerged uh, in the industry, and also uh, first secondary educational programs in the field of fashion in Slovenia uh, has uh, started their started their programs. Here we can see in the building of fashionista some of the the um, examples uh, of that time and some of the brands that has emerged at that um, time. And um, um, if we would compare uh, those uh, clothing forms seen on those pictures, we can easily make their uh, Western, um, uh, Western uh, examples at the same time. But also fashionista at that time, which as you can see, it's also differently written. It's not the, one, uh, the word that we know as fashionista, as the one who is following fashion, global fashion trends. In Slovenian uh, case, in building of national fashion identities, this fashionista actually was uh, following the local trends, which emerged um, in the creativity of the fashion designers at uh, that time. If we are looking from the perspective of the geographical context of, um, of the space, which is reflected then uh, in the building of uh, fashion identity, um, we have to say the Slovenian uh, fashion is rather small uh, fashion, not just in the sense of symbolic value, this is the comparison to Italy, and the, uh, the circles marks, marks the, the revenue by the Statista in 1991, so the size of, of uh, Italy in the global context is 15, is their ranking in the 15 um, place, um, comparing to Slovenian fashion, which is uh, the 75th uh, place. So it's a huge, huge difference among those, those national uh, fashion identities. But of course, also in symbolic um, uh, value, because globally, we all see that um, Milan as one of the four major centers, fashion centers is placed in Italy. And of course, if we say made in Italy, it has another meaning saying or comparing to made in Slovenia. And in that sense, we have to talk about um, uh, decolonization of uh, fashion, which um, takes place not just in the production, or um, uh, the um, way how we manage the uh, labor laws uh, connecting to the fashion production, but also in the symbolic ways. We have to be very aware of, um, of the meaning and be proud of the meaning of the Slovenian fashion uh, as it emerged on a special special um, and specific cultural, uh, cultural backgrounds. In that sense, of course, we can look at the 70s, um, in the 70s uh, of the last century, where all of the Slovenian fashion identity uh, has emerged and also today has its uh, impact. 
In the economic context of the space, some of the good examples has emerged not just in the production way, but also in distribution, distribution uh, sense. Uh, here are the examples of do-it-yourself um, 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 activities that uh, has been placed from, um, um, from the um, uh, fashion brand uh, Almira and uh, the fashion designer at at the time uh, in this brand, Vesna Gabarčik, who started um, the projects uh, of the hand-knitted uh, projects and involved people around the, the uh, Slovenia to participate in the open calls for the, um, for the competitions. Some of the later uh, important um, um, artists um, also participated in those in those um, uh, competitions, one of them uh, also um, uh, Xenia uh, Baraga. And this was important because today we speak a lot about do it yourself, do it together. So some, uh, some, um, um, some ways of implementing, uh, implementing um, 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 sustainable, sustainable methodologies and uh, also strategies in the fashion design uh, of today. And this is the example of uh, different approaches in the economic uh, context of space, which include the includes the distribution, um, one of the four pillars of fashion uh, design, the other three, production and design, the education and uh, the media. And this is uh, the, the um, example of how in Slovenia, in the, uh, in the forming of national fashion identity, call, as I call it, fashionista, has emerged the fashion collection, the fashion brand in, uh, within the uh, fashion media. This was uh, Ars Vivendi, one of the rare fashion, independent fashion medias in Slovenia who started its own fashion brand. This is really unique uh, in, a, in a world, worldwide um, examples that you have a fashion media which starts its own uh, fashion uh, brand with its own also fashion distribution. Dis distribution. Uh, uh, so you can hear with own, own um, shops. Uh, one of them was also um, Modna Hisha, who started uh, with its own uh, fashion labels. The next context of the space, which is very important for the building of national identity, is um, historical context. In this way, um, of course, as, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, um, taking place also this a symposium in, in museums. In Slovenia, we have um, museums on a national uh, uh, and uh, national level, but also on the regional and uh, city level that holds some, uh, some um, collections of, um, of uh, Slovenian fashion. Among them, a very important and the largest uh, uh, archive of, Slovenia, of the fashion in Slovenia uh, region is the um, Regional Museum of Maribor, as uh, one of the curators is also Mayhen Bervar that is moderating this symposium of today. And um, I'm presenting here also um, the starting of the digital archive of Slovenian uh, fashions. Um, then I'm running with the Center of Design Research uh, we, because I feel it's important that we also have these fashion designers which um, were um, in many cases um, hidden behind the brands and uh, not really seen who they are with their names and surnames and especially with their faces, their presentations. And here are just the photos um, of some of them of the beginning of this digital, um, digital archive of Slovenian uh, fashions that is now taking uh, place. And I hope in the near future will also uh, be recognized um, on the national level that it is important uh, to um, establish uh, on a national level 
the fashion uh, museums. Um, as we speak in the, uh, in the environmental context of building uh, Fashionista, we, uh, this was a research uh, done, done two years ago um, of the Slovenian fashion today and some data that were, that were collected. collected. Slovenian fashion um, identity of today is very much um, sustainable um, uh, oriented, although um, it's not a highly marketized or it's not highly uh, marketing um, in a highly marketing uh, position uh, with all those data and facts that actually uh, holds um, that are holding uh, fashion brands in Slovenia. But um, if we are talking with the usage of um, some uh, like short uh, supply chains or uh, um, uh, local um, production chains or uh, um, regarding the connection to the involvement of the, of the users uh, in the design process, uh, Slovenian fashion national identity fashionista is really, really uh, sustainable, uh, in, sustainably um, uh, uh, in a surplus um, if you compare it to other nearby, uh, uh, nearby uh, fashion systems. Uh, also, uh, in respect of ethical and um, uh, principles and moral principles, of course, we are following uh, high um, laws regarding that with the uh, production order. And um, coming to the end of my uh, production, thank you, Maya, for um, reminding me. Of course, we have to talk uh, also uh, about the cultural context of uh, Fashionista. This cultural context of Fashionista was uh, old, always very highly uh, connected with the subcultural um, uh, definition of fashion. There are some uh, uh, examples. Very highly was this uh, recognized in the 80s. And uh, today, um, some of the fashion, um, fashion brands and fashion designers are strongly connected to the uh, subculture and are to sending it into their uh, brands. So to summarize and finish um, my presentation, the Slovenian national identity is fashionista, is the fashion following fashion trends, but from the perspective from uh, the East. It has its origins, of course, in the 70s, but uh, and followed through the 80s and 90s, and is strongly in this millennium uh, connected to the, um, to the um, uh, space, this abstract space of uh, Slovenia as we know today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so would you please come and chat with me for a little bit? Uh, so what is national fashion identity with, um, in Slovenia? Can we talk about Slovenian fashion? What is Slovenian fashion? What are influences to Slovenian fashion? Are there Austrians or Hungarians or more Italy because we are so located in these borders? Or are ethnical groups or can we talk about Slovenian fashion identity? If we uh, follow the research and the data uh, from the past, from the history, if we are following the brands today, um, how they um, make their fashion design or the process, we can definitely can um, say we have national fashion identity. But of course we have to look at it from the inner perspective and from the uh, outer perspective. Mm -hmm. The fashion identity, if we say, um, yes, we do have fashion, a national fashion identity, of course, this is the inner perspective. From the yeah. outer perspective, nobody really knows yeah. what made in Slovenia means. But this is just um, the way how we have to market our um, national fashion mm -hmm. identity and uh, not the value that we hold, but how we present ourselves. As I have um, 
said before, of course, many of the brands, they don't even present their work as sustainable, but they have many aspects of it. Yeah. So it's just the way how we present ourselves, no, not if we do hold this identity, national identity. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, points that, of course, do point uh, or support this, my argument. First of all, if we look from, from history, uh, we always had these local production chains. We always yeah. followed the local pro production chains from different reasons, but nevertheless, at the end, the result was the short uh, supply chains or the, the production chains. We always followed some uh, cultural heritage. We, we, there were collections throughout the history of Slovenian mm -hmm. fashion that have these uh, connections. We always um, had supportive consumers mm -hmm. that, um, of course, has its um, respect for the Slovenian fashion. Mm -hmm. What we lacked is the outer perspective, so how we can be proud of our mm -hmm. Slovene fashion identity and show with no, um, how to say, um, um, you know, we have to be not just proud, but also um, very focused in these global fashion trends, mm -hmm. saying, yes, we do exist. And it is important that you know us. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a bit m more higher self-esteem in the fashion uh, <laughs> national In identity. every areas. <laughs> in every areas, probably, yeah. yes. So you mentioned before that uh, designers that were established in 60s, 70s um, were hidden. Mm -hmm. What about today? What are today's contemporary fashion, Slovenian fashion designers? Well, the problem is, of course, if in the past their market was much uh, broader. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, much more million people were potential consumers of their work. And um, also at that time they were presenting their, their work on uh, very respectful fairs and um, some of them really gained major, major awards for their work. Uh, and rightfully, of course. Um, today's fashion is more about names, but not about regular production, which of course is a problem if we're talking about the, the fashion system, about the fashion, because uh, fashion needs regularity in production, in presentation. We cannot have names which every now and then uh, produce fashion collections which are great, which are respectful, which can be really compared to any global collection at the time, but, but they have no um, regularity in time. So mm -hmm. they, for example, to, uh, uh, um, this year they show the collection, maybe next year they will not show, yeah. or even, even um, um, worse, uh, they, they are not, um, they are not um, selling those clothes. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. just for the show, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, they don't leave up from their work. Mm -hmm. So I think today they are um, they are visible. So fashion um, designers are visible with their mm -hmm. names, surnames, faces. Not so much with their brands, mm -hmm. but in the past the brands were really strong. Mm -hmm and without faces yeah, and without yeah. names and surnames of the people who were behind the production mm -hmm. and the design. Mm -hmm. um, are there many uh, contemporary Slovenian fashion designers that uh, succeed in abroad, uh, in, in the world? Yes, they are. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we don't surprisingly, know about them. Yeah, surprisingly, they are. They've been uh, through many years. Mm. Um, some of them, I won't name them, but um, of course they were uh, trying to come back and uh, nobody in Slovenia really wanted them, so they went back um, abroad. Uh, yeah, we have a good educational system in fashion design mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all of those people are su successful um, uh, abroad in the global global fashion world. Yeah. 
but I think it's important that, that also here we start to mark the fashion as a very important economic force. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not just the, a cultural uh, force, yes. uh, but it's an economic force. Mm -hmm. And um, that, of course, reflects the society, reflects this abstract values of the space mm -hmm. and we have to recognize fashion uh, as one of the of the forces that as a part of design that was also heard today as a part of design that can change uh, the society the space mm -hmm. that we live in mm -hmm. and as soon as the we will um, acknowledge that and start to respect fashion design as one of the creative industries yeah. Um, the better um, our society it, uh, will live, no yeah. matter how funny this may be yeah. uh, is uh, heard, but also um, that will follow the economic part. Yeah. Because all those people behind um, fashion um, system that we have now, of course, cannot participate in the same um, structure, in the same force as they would if we would appreciate their work and, yeah, of and course, open them. our space yeah. for, their, um, for their creativity. Yeah. Thank you very much for thank this you, lovely Maya. conversation. And thank you all. And wishing you all the best on your projects. And <laughs> thank you. Now, I would like to announce a well-deserved coffee break. Welcome back. I hope you had a pleasant pause. Now we will continue with our presentations. A warm welcome to our next guest, Mr. Stefan Jaric, a PhD candidate in Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Novi Sad in Serbia, who undertook and devoted himself to an interesting topic, our first lady of the East, political incorrectness of Melania Trump's fashion identity. Stefan Jaric is a fashion historian and PhD candidate at the University of Novi Sad, where he researches fashion in Shakespeare's great tragedies and their representations in all Kutu. Besides studying art history in Serbia, Estonia, and the USA, Stefan has further specialized in fashion history in the UK and Japan. He curated the first all Kutu exhibition in Serbia, Jean Paul Gaultier and currently serves as a broad member of ICOM Costume Committee and Fashion History Contributor and El Serbia. Stefan Jaric will present his contribution on the theme, Our First Lady of the East, Political Incorrectness of Melania Trump's Fashion Identity. Welcome. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. It is really lovely to be here. Uh, the last time I was here, I went to uh, Regional Museum of Maribor with Maya in 2019, where we had a similar uh, conference. Uh, I'm glad I can represent a millennial uh, generation of fashion historians coming besides the solidified uh, Western curtain, as I would say, Tanya, you might agree with me <laughs> on this. Uh, I was thinking about a subject that I would present upon coming here uh, when Professor Devetak invited me, uh, and I thought there's probably no better place uh, to talk about um, all the glory of Melania Trump's fashion than her native Slovenia, uh, of course, and um, as myself have lived a lot in the United States where I went to high school and college, and coming from a country uh, to which I always said to explain that it's not Siberia or Syria, but Serbia. Uh, I thought I would just talk about political correctness, cancel culture, liberal hysteria, and everything that is consuming our society. When uh, yesterday, uh, Tanya picked me up from the airport after passing through a rigorous check uh, being uh, outside of European Union as a Serbian citizen, we passed by your parliament building, which I thought was a Swedish embassy. Uh, because there was Ukrainian flag in front of it. I couldn't figure it was a Ukrainian flag. Um, uh, I thought it was Swedish embassy or at least Ukrainian embassy. Then I realized that Slovenia is part of a global uh, identity crisis uh, and hysteria, uh, which I think is quite summed up in what Melania Trump or our image of her represents. Uh, so how do we, okay. 
so uh, in order to speak, and I, of course, as you see, I uh, uh, titled my presentation Our First Lady of the East, uh, thinking about, of course, of Melania Trump, uh, but as well the, you know, the religious syntax, uh, Nasha Gospa, all right, and, and uh, Yugoslav languages. Uh, in order to speak about um, Melania Trump, I think that we have to refer to her common signifier and mother of all the first ladies that came after, and not many did come after. It's, of course, Yovanka Braz, uh, former uh, President Tito's wife. Uh, and um, with all this ongoing hysteria, I don't know, maybe did you uh, recently uh, see? Uh, as uh, Tanya, you followed on my Facebook profile, um, there was a special edition of Belgrade Fashion Week. Uh, if you're not familiar, Bel Belgrade Fashion Week is the oldest fashion week and the first of its kind in the entire Eastern Europe. So from Moscow to Istanbul, Ljubljana, Budapest, Bucharest, uh, uh, the one in Belgrade starting in 1996 was the first. Uh, and uh, a few days ago, there was a special edition of Belgrade Fashion Week uh, devoted to Jovanka Broz. All the designers gathered, uh, not just from Serbia, but former Yugoslav states as well, were invited to imagine how Jovanka would look like on a contemporary uh, uh, runway. I don't know, do you recognize the other person? It's our, uh, the person who represented us at Eurovision this year. Just to be mentioned, we will never forgive you for giving Italy 12 points and not to Serbia. Uh, this is Constructa, who sang in Coporesano. She opened the, Euro, uh, the uh, runway by representing Jovanka Braz. Uh, and this leads us to our beloved lady. And the, the trouble we have with Jovanka Ivanka today is the same one that we have with Melania. Uh, when I posted on my Facebook about, uh, as I work for Elle, the fashion magazine, when I posted my review of the show, uh, a lot of my friends from the West, so a lot of uh, very white privileged people, uh, called me a fascist or a Nazist. Uh, as I have studied in Estonia, and Estonia suffers from kind of similar historical complex as Slovenia and Croatia upon entering European Union. I'm sorry, I'm very politically incorrect, as you will see. Uh, so uh, they don't like to be called Eastern European. They don't like, the same as I guess Slovenia doesn't like to be called Balkan or post-Yugoslav. Uh, so a lot of my friends from Estonia uh, have removed me from Facebook and wrote a really bad comments when I posted a uh, fashion runway of Jovanka Broz because one of the creations had a symbol of communism, Srepi uh, Cekic, right, hammer and sickle, uh, a symbol that is nowadays uh, forbidden by law in Estonia, which equates Nazism with communism as oppressive regimes. Uh, and this led me to think a lot about contemporary hysteria that is uh, very much present in the image of Melania Trump. Uh, uh, when Melania Trump assumed her role as the first lady, she became the first person of Yugoslav and more particularly Slovenian origin to become the first lady of, uh, I think, uh, not just America, but one Western country, and the first professional model uh, to do so. This was, of course, taken a lot against her, and I think that um, in America, people did not know much about Slovenia, same as they don't know uh, uh, about, uh, about Serbia. Uh, I think that Melania Trump really brought a lot of uh, colonial discourse into understanding of the, is it already eight minutes? No, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was your, okay, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, and Melania Trump brought a lot of this for her inauguration in January 2020. She wore this gorgeous Ralph uh, Lauren dress. And since this moment, there has been a lot of con cancel culture discourse around her. Uh, like what designers should design for her. And of course, democratic elites in America were very quick to discredit every single designer who would design for her. But we must also not forget that designers would not necessarily directly design for a person, but the person can simply go and buy right. something uh, in a democratic society, right? Uh, here we can see more of it. And recently, uh, if you're familiar with Met Gala, the annual fashion exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, this year was very controversial because of uh, Kim Kardashian and Marilyn Monroe dress. Um, and the subject was an America ontology of fashion. It was supposed, exhibition was supposed to represent the cultural and political identity of the US. And of course, curators and director of the museum, they were first to say how this dress must not be exhibited by all means. It would be so inappropriate. And I think on the contrary, it would be perfect to have, for example, this dress next to Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, pink suit. I think it would be marvelous uh, trajectory. 
Um, uh, another idea that uh, stems from uh, all this political incorrectness is, of course, Melania being, being a Slavic person, an Eastern European person, uh, a Yugoslav person. Uh, and here we can see her uh, wearing a dress by a Serbian designer when you, Maya, and Tanya talked about the visibility of Slovenian uh, designers in the world. Uh, and I think that um, uh, probably when it comes to Serbia, uh, this is addressed by Roxanda Ilimcic. Uh, she uh, uh, now resides in London. Uh, uh, Roxanda has dressed Kate Middleton, uh, Madame Macron. Uh, she has dressed Michelle Obama. Uh, and I think it was really um, a, a pe peculiar curiosity for Melania Trump to choose a dress by a former Yugoslav uh, or a fellow Yugoslav designer as well. This was for the Republican National Convention just before the Trump would, um, uh, would become president. And of course, all the Western media was talking about uh, how it's uh, not fair that Melania as a first lady would wear uh, non-American designers. Mm -hmm. Unlike today, we have with Jill Biden who is fully wearing just American uh, American designers. Uh, why we should be careful who we dress. On this image, we can as well see a creation by Roxanda Ilincic. If you're not familiar, in Serbia, we have a prime minister who is lesbian, so this is her, this is her partner. Um, and uh, this is L'Officiel Arabia. As you know, uh, in Saudi Arabia, homosexuality is punished by law. Uh, so uh, I think that this speaks a lot about political incorrectness. And uh, I wanted to ask myself if Roxanda Ilincic, the designer who now lives in London with British citizenship, um, uh, and has this privilege, if she was living maybe in Slovenia or Serbia, would we cancel her for dressing such uh, problematic political figures uh, as um, uh, a Serbian Prime Minister Anna Brnabic is her name, uh, or uh, Melania, Melania Trump. This is just a side information. Uh, Roxanda has as well dressed, uh, uh, um, uh, as you can see, Michelle Obama. Uh, this was just a few days ago. I was dying when I saw this. It's like so perfect, this image on so many levels. Uh, this was just a few days ago on Michelle Obama's book promotion. Uh, and when um, Melania appeared in this dress, it's, the same dress was worn by Michelle Obama a few years ago when she was the first lady married to, as she still is, to former President Barack. Um, so a lot of Western media at one point said it's so very bad for Melania to be dressed by a Serbian or Yugoslav. Or, uh, I'm not sure, maybe Tanya, you can tell what she ever dressed by a Slovene designer. I think that she hasn't been. Uh, uh, so we can, we can uh, have this as, as, as a question, why not or why yes. Um, uh, so, uh, and then Michelle Obama wore uh, Serbian design on several occasions. And I must also say, speaking in terms of visibility of Serbian fashion, in terms of first ladies, uh, probably the most famous Serbian fashion designer ever, he is considered father of British and Scottish textile industry, Bernard Klein, um, has designed uh, the tweed for many of uh, uh, Jackie Kennedy's suit as well. So we had two designer dressing three first ladies of the USA. Uh, and I entitled this for, uh, a title, Diesel Dreams. As you know, in the 90s, there was a lot of diesel culture, uh, diesel ash and gusta by three in, um, in Yugoslavia. Uh, and I think it's just funny how people took so much uh, uh, against Melania for being a Yugoslav, for being a Slovenian. Um, and um, if you've been in America before or after or during, uh, uh, Trump's presidency, a lot of people will just consider Melania Russian, but as an insult, especially now with uh, everything going on in Ukraine. So I thought it's really funny to see Michelle Obama styled um, as she's looking like she's gonna sell fake perfumes in Belgrade. Like at least it looks like that to me in her, shushka, we call this shushkavats, you know, the trainer yeah, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> you understand. Uh, and this leads us to these ongoing uh, politically incorrect fashion wars. Yeah, great, we're gonna finish. Uh, as you know, Melania Trump, despite being the, f um, the first professional fashion model, she has never appeared in Vogue. You know that Anna Ventor is one of the b biggest sponsors of American Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, so uh, recently the new uh, episodes of Sex in the City, uh, it's called uh, Just Like That, I think. 
Uh, and there was this very unnerving moment at the beginning, the first episode. And you know, everyone is genderqueer and non-binary and Irish American, Mexican refugee, all this identity politics. Uh, you know, I myself am half Ukrainian and a queer person, just not to think that uh, <laughs> this is having something to do against uh, such identities. And there is a scene in which Carrie Bradshaw is opening the show with her latest iPhone. And then on the iPhone is a sticker of Democratic Party. A few days after that, of course, Biden assumed the position as a new president and Jill Biden after Kamala Harris appeared on Vogue. Um, these flowers on her dress should represent, I guess, 50 states of America or something. So she was sending much different message to Melania, who was choosing European designers, and particularly Eastern or fashion Eastern European designers. Then on the other side, we have, uh, uh, I really don't know how to comment on this, uh, Olena Zelenska uh, on the cover of Vogue. Both her photos are photographed by Amy Leibovitz. Um, so I just thought that this is an interesting trajectory. Melania Trump did appear on a cover of magazine. Uh, ironically, it was Vanity Fair, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I thought this was beautiful, uh, and she's not the designer who needs, I guess she's not uh, uh, the one who needs to be in Vogue after all. Um, and um, it leaves us a lot with a lot of bitterness and high hopes and high heels. This is the last official outfit Melania wore as, um, as a first lady. I'm just going to move from microphone, but I guess with my baritone profile, though, you're going um, <laughs> uh, to hear. So she's wearing Christian Louboutin shoes. She has been wearing uh, these heels for four years during her uh, service. She has um, Hermes Birkin bag. She has a jacket by Chanel and dressed by Dolce Gabbana. So very cold to European fashion designers. So there is nothing American on the, uh, the most fashionable American first lady here. And this look, she just killed it. And of course, fashion media was not even reporting on this, but they were reporting about Jill, which was so boring, and Michelle Obama, and the little poet, uh, Amanda Gorman, who was reciting the poem. Uh, and they were all wearing um, designs by American immigrants uh, mm -hmm. and stuff like this. And then uh, after, before she entered the plane, this was in the White House and leaving house home to Florida, she has appeared for the first time in just ballerinas. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was such a powerful statement yeah. for Melania Trump to appear in. This is a Gucci dress, so again, not American design. Um, uh, uh, to show this immobility of our ideas and how much we read into this political incorrectness. And I think the fashion is really here to remind us that with a lot of freedom, I think, comes great responsibility uh, and not vice versa. And um, this is something that her um, stylist uh, um, called bipartisan dressing. I think this probably must be one of my favorite terms in fashion history in which he, of course, being on the target for four years for dressing a fascist, I guess. Um, and then he said that bipartisan dressing should actually kind of separate politics from fashion, and I think this is wrong. I think mm -hmm. this must be united. And this is, uh, I think, probably one of my favorite moments. Uh, Melania Trump appeared in a 30 euros Zara jacket mm -hmm. while visiting a center for immigrant children in Texas. And uh, it said, I really don't okay. care, do you? And I thought it was just such a powerful statement. I will not even comment on this. Uh, and she didn't want to comment when asked. Of course, Western media said, oh my God, she went to see immigrant children and she told them, I don't care. Well, those children were there before Trump assumed the office, same as the very atrocious border between America and Mexico, and same as nowadays problems between Moscow and Kiev. Uh, so maybe just think about it. And my question to you would be, do you really care? Thank you so much. This is it for me. <laughs> Thank you. So please. Um, so, First Lady Melania Trump has been a controversial figure during her time at the White House. Uh, and she began stirring controversy with her style prior to Trump taking office. And one of the most widely criticized fashion choices came during the second 2016 presidential debate between Trump and Hillary Clinton. The first lady chose to wear a fuchsia Gucci bow blouse. Just days after the infamous Excess Hollywood a tape leak that showed Trump making vulgar comments. <laughs> and would it be different if this blouse was worn by Michelle Obama? Of course. <laughs> I mean, we, we all know this because they wore the same dress by Roxanda. And yeah. 
there was, you know, uh, in case of Michelle, it was always, she was compared to Kate Middleton because we know that Roxanda, you know, living in London, she had started dressing the European elite, particularly mm -hmm. around London and Paris. Uh, and then this was seen as something empowering. Uh, it was seen as, uh, you know, first lady is the extension of president as such. Fashion is viewed as a very uh, direct form of soft power. Uh, and uh, in case of Michelle, this was used, of course, and, uh, oh, you know, our first lady is, uh, you know, looking at designer from this forsaken country. We don't even know where to put it on the map and you know, uh, all of this. And when the M Melania does it, it was like, oh, this is so anti-American, yeah. you know, and of course we know that Trump's campaign was make America great again. Mm. Uh, and yeah. uh, it was, I think it would have been much different. Yeah, yeah. And that um, off-white belt sleeve uh, dress by, by um, Serbian-born, London-based designer Alexander Ilincic, rather than one made by American designer, she chose. Uh, she bought it uh, herself uh, through Annette Potier. Yes. And according to a spokeswoman who also told that she isn't working with any designers. So the dress was immediately sold out online, exactly. of course. And we all also know that Michelle Obama wore several outfits from the same designer. Um, and let's talk about Roxanda Ilincic for okay. a bit. <laughs> so, uh, Roxanda studied architecture and applied arts in the University of Belgrade yes. before uh, moving to London. Well, yeah, Melania started studying architecture yeah. here, right? Yeah, also, <laughs> yeah. Where she graduated with an MA in women's wear from Central St. Martins. She is the brand of choice for some of the world's most high-profile women. Why do you think that is so? Um, I think because uh, there is still a lot of exoticism in the mm -hmm. West and the post-colonial discourse in fashion, but as well because Roxanda is famous several other designers from this part of the world or for, uh, from Eastern Europe overall are breaking with the tradition by at the same time accentuating it. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, we had uh, Macron's wife, we had uh, Kate Middleton and two first ladies mm -hmm. of uh, of America. I would love to see Jill wearing it. I don't know yeah. how would she <laughs> look in it, <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, I think everyone can look good in Roxanda. I think it's just because um, uh, partially the, there is a lot of form and colors in her designs, and this is what she always accentuates. Yeah, yeah. But there is also something that looks eminently different. Yeah. And it, as we saw on Michelle Obama looking like the and uh, <laughs> in, the, yeah. in that photo. So I think there is some sort of uh, alert to, mm -hmm. to her design. Uh, because she, she said, uh, my roots are very closely tied to the DNA of the brand. Uh, and growing up in Serbia, where women are unapologetically very feminine, I came to London and realized that I wanted to keep this feminine element, but give it a twist and challenge ideas of classical beauty. So that is... Sorry. Yeah, but it's funny to see how this can resonate both with Melania yeah, and, and yeah. Michelle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, while traveling to Texas for an announced visit uh, to a shelter housing children separated from their parents in the USA, as we've seen, um, she wore Zara jacket with this message. Um, and also this custom blue Ralph Lauren suit of her husband's presidential inauguration. Um, a source that Ralph Lauren, who asked to remain anonymous, uh, told Glamour, we immediately started to get complaints about Melania Trump wearing the label. Do fashion labels need to be careful about who is wearing them? Well, as I said, yes and no, because I want to believe that fashion is the highest form of democracy because it's so close to our bodies. And if we can't express ourselves unapologetically, yeah. because really our clothes technically do not alter anyone unless someone is really allergic on like some part yeah. of like <laughs> technical laboratory of uh, mm -hmm. part of our clothing, so they might die from it. Yeah. But uh, what we wear is uh, someone else's uh, someone else's projection, and I really think that this message was important. But yeah, there was, uh, even nowadays, if you're gonna join some Facebook groups, like fashion historians or fashion museums, and uh, when they would post a photo of Melania or Michelle, uh, the administrator immediately disables the comments. It's like, we mm -hmm. don't comment. I was like, yeah, but if we can comment on like Queen Elizabeth, yeah. or if we can comment on, yeah. you know, and if I posted, for example, a photo of Tamara Vucic, Vucic's president, uh, Serbian president's wife, or your new president, I don't think they would know who this is, even yeah. though these figures are as well problematic. 
But I saw this, you know, and then there was a lot of backlash with designers. Uh, and I remember there was uh, a call to lynch uh, Dolce and Gabbana, mm. who were uh, very unapologetically and openly taking pride in dressing yeah. Melania yeah. Uh, and Melania Trump. Uh, but I think um, these, as well, fashion houses are very immune because if we didn't cancel Chanel Fashion House over Gabrielle Chanel being a literal Nazi, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think we can't cancel them for Melania Trump wearing, uh, wearing yeah. their jacket. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the last question, what do you personally think of, uh, what, or what is your opinion about Melania's fashion style? not only as a former first lady, but also in general. Well, my question to all of you, uh, uh, at least those who identify as Slovenes, would be, uh, what is your, you know, where is a fashionista, where is Slovenia in Melania Trump's mm -hmm. style? Where is, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, did she wear fashion designers from Slovenia, but was there something in her that made you feel proud that you were like, this is, this is, our, our, this is our lady mm -hmm. of the East. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that she will probably remain the most fashionable yeah. figure. Of course, we have Jackie Kennedy and we have Michelle Obama who look different but have remained very, uh, very fashionable. Of course, Joe Biden is much older and she mm -hmm. comes from educational background, so yeah. she's, she's putting some effort, but I'm not liking it, it's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, but I would rather invite you all to think about, uh, because she is uh, from our country, from your country, uh, uh, where is Slovenian fashion in Melania, and where is Slovenia identity that I personally did not see, uh, but mm -hmm. maybe um, that is something else were there feelings of pride, mm -hmm. of joy? Mm -hmm. uh, were you angry? Did you feel that the West is gonna cancel you because Melania <laughs> is from Slovenia, you know, mm -hmm. or something? So maybe we can conclude this with this open question okay. to you, my fellow Slovenians. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan, for this exciting conversation um, on such an interesting topic. So. We are moving forward to the next presentation, which will be held by Associate Professor Dr. Yasminka Koncic, who will be with us online with the theme on fashion migration identity with three approaches to closing design. Since 2001, Yasminka Koncic has been working at the Faculty of Textile Technology, University of Zagreb. 2011, she became an assistant professor at the Department of Textile and Closing Design. She has been exhibiting independently and collectively at home and abroad since 1996. In working with the medium of textile, she calls into question its connoti connotative meaning in contemporary art. Archetypal connection between the textile and the seamstress, the housewife and the mother, is the foundation of most of her works. Therefore, the textile and different techniques such as sewing, embroidery, and cross-stitch became artistic tools she uses to analyze topics closely connected to the nature of a woman and her hybridized role today. Dela Ramic will present her contribution with the title Fashion Migration Identity, Three Approaches to Closing Design. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, <coughs> Okay, uh, today I'll introduce you with the work of three younger designers who were uh, in introduce uh, their work to wider public with the exhibition Fashion Migration Identities, which was held in Vladimir Nazor Gallery in Zagreb. Uh, the exhibition presented the collection Ex Vonia by Damir Begovic, uh, Rebellion Sounds by Matea Bosek and The uh, Invisible Part by Anna Kergovic. In 2020, all of they were MA students on Faculty of Textile Technology at University in Zagreb. These young designers used cultural identities of African, Asian, and Croatian migrants as a conceptual foundation for the design of contemporary fashion collections. The first one is collection Exvonia by Damir Begovic. 
And as an introduction uh, to the collection, I'll show you the Exvonia exhibit video. moment. In this video, we can see that Dar Begovic collection is inspired by lowish Slavonian folk costumes as an homage to designer's home region. Dar Begovic uses folk costumes as a personification of his own cultural heritage, his origin, but also as a synonym for the current mass depopulation of his home, uh, Slavonia, as a direct consequence of the people's migration to more affluent parts of the uh, European Union in search of a better life. The starting point for the design of Damir collection uh, are the traditional elements and handiwork techniques of Slavonian folk costume. We can see uh, gold and silver thread embroidery. For example, on the left, we can see the photography of traditional gold thread embroidery, and on the right, we can see new digital and 3D sculptural interpretation of them in Exvonia collection. The other traditional elements are krilca, šlinga, molovanje, uh, glass sequins, and križera scarf. On the other side, uh, Damir Begovic coll collections is inspired by haute couture as a personification of Western affluence. In order to capture the mood and character of fashion silhouettes, he employs the photo collage technique for his initial sketches. He designs sketches by cross-referencing visuals from the golden era of haute couture and authentic Slavonian folk costume. Garments are mutating into clothing hybrids that impersonate the newly emerged hybrid identities of migrants in their new environment. 
This uh, hypothesis is further supported by the fact that faces in most sketches are void of identity and personality covered by scars and textile patterns in mega dimensions. The next collection, uh, uh, which I will introduce you, is The Invisible Pet by Anna Krgovic. Uh, the Invisible Pet resulted from the designer's research on interculturalism and migrations between the European and African continent. The designer focuses her research on the Mediterranean migration route as one of the deadliest migration routes. Anna Krgovic places emphasis on danger by using second-hand waterproof textiles and a, a symbolic circle associated with the concept of movement and the metaphor of a uh, life buoy. Anna Krgovic clothing uh, successfully combines uh, combines elements of African cultural heritage with Eastern European manner of dressing whereby she uh, rep repositions African textile patterns and ritual clothing silhouettes into Western European fashion silhouettes. The designer uh, contrasts the African cultural identity with the Western European one through a palette of colors and the color intensive textile pattern, which she creates digitally using the aesthetics of the cultural heritage of sub-Saharan uh, region, Kente clothes, and on the uh, Adin Kira symbols. On the one hand, the designer emphasizes the body's physique, its anatomical values and distinct fragility and fatality with anatomical clothing silhouettes. On the other hand, in the Invisible Pad collection, we find extremely ritualistic silhouettes similar to oversized ritual masks that erase every element of individuality and personality from the body of the person who wears them. Krgovic designs her fabrics in blue, yellow, blue, red, black, red, and white, black, red color, uh, are combinations and uh, symbolic meanings of the colors of the original Kente cloth. The collection uh, Rebellious Silence is the next uh, collection which we can see on the exhibition uh, by Matea Bosek, focuses on questioning the role of aesthetic and ethnic elements from Asian clothing cultures in the context context of uh, West European culture and clothing styles. The designer uh, uses garments in her collection to question the, the sustainability of an identity, the sense of not belonging and globalization as a treat to cultural and national identities in the West. The collection, the collection uh, Rebellious Silence, uh, questions the paranoid perceptions of aesthetic futures of Eastern culture and immigrants living in the West. The designer researched traditional women's clothing in the Middle East, particularly focusing on the whale in Islamic culture and question of covering the uh, women's body. The collection Rebellion Silence puts the whale in contact with contemporary fashion and grants it the freedom of choice. The designer deconstructs the well and modifies it into a hood. Also, Matea Bosek deconstructs traditional decorative uh, fragment of Islamic art and put in a new contemporary context. Next. Uh, if we have uh, enough time, I will um, show you another film.
I will conclude uh, that through three different approaches to fashion design, the exhibition Fashion Migrations Identities addresses and questions the influence of dynamic contemporary migration trends and interculturality in the context of fashion design. It has been shown that the face is the focal point perceived as a personal identification card, which greatly speaks of our cultural and national identities. We can see a new body uh, and changes through the dynamic process of migrations. Thank you. Thank you much. So several studies uh, demonstrate that migration plays a crucial role in self-discovery through fashion because individuals may sustain, change, or incorporate various cultures in developing their own style. What is your opinion about that? Uh, can I see on creation? Um, znano je da studije migracije um, dale jo vlogu um, da posamezne skupine uh, individu... Ne, mogu vam ja to. Aha, se slišimo? Je malo prekida, tako da... Aha, prekinja, ja. Um, so, mm -hmm. I'm going to the next question. Um, do we renounce okay. our own national identities by leaving our domicile? Uh, dakle, naši, naši identitet su zato nekako definirani sredinom u kojem živimo. Danice unutar Europa postaju među. Ti identiteti zapravo počinju uh, migrirati i uh, poprimati sasvim neke drugačije ovoga konotacije. Uh, ono što je zanimljivo i što smo mogli možda vidjeti u radovima ovih mladih uh, dizajnera je zapravo uh, propitivanje uloge uh, promjene tog identiteta i uloge uh, adaptacije, prilagodbe samom nekom novom dakle, području i njegovim kulturološkim zakonitostima. Tako da ovoga, to postaje pitanje koje je sve dominantnije u modi i ono što je zapravo bitno reći je to da identiteti, da se oni mijenjaju i da postaju uh, neki hibridni oblik koji isto tako kroz mediju odjeće i odjevanja poprima jedan sasvim zapravo drugi uh, kontekst. Aha, hvala. Um, so, uh, as I uh, started the question uh, mm. to demonstrate that migration do play a crucial role in self-discovery through fashion, and individuals may also sustain and change and incorporate various cultures in developing their own style. So, um, how to translate traditional clothing into contemporary fashion design, and is there a fear that modernity, modernity will overtake authenticity? Uh, dakle, ono što je bitno kad se uh, poseže za etnobaštinom kao nekakvim nacionalnim preslikom, simbolom nacionalnog identiteta, Sada zapravo je pitanje koliko on može biti modni i koliko može sa sobom povlačiti pitanje mode zbog toga što je tradicionalni narodni kostim zapravo anagorija, jedna nepromjenjiva kategorija odjevanja. U tom kontekstu vrlo je važno prepoznati elemente koji se mogu modificirati i postati modni elementi. Često puta oni poprimaju sasvim neke druge siluete i tehnike produkcije nego što je to zapravo slučaj 
u izvornom načinu oblikovanja. Dakle, tu su, kao što smo vidjeli, anatomska silueta izrazita koja je simbol još nečeg drugog osim samo odjevanja. Znači, ona je simbol nekakve zapadne afirmacije tijela, što narodni kostim zapravo kao takav niti nema. I ono što je dakle bitno, to je da su zapravo sve tradicionalne tehnike nekakva mogućnost za reinterpretaciju kroz nove oblike oblikovanja. Ono što je bitno za modu, to je da ona ne smije nikad preslikati doslovce elemente nacionalnog identiteta i preuzeti iz narodnih nošnji, jer zapravo tada samo dobivamo replike u odjevanju ili neke krivo citirane načine odjevanja koje često puta završavaju i u kiću i u nekom nesporazumu i nerazumijevanju, estetskom i konceptualnom. Tako da ovoga treba biti vrlo oprezan u tom preuzimanju elemenata i njihovom konceptualnom prerađivanju u suvremeni modni izričaj. Ok. Thank you. Thank you very much for this conversation and wishing you all the best on your professional path and such great projects. Okay, thank you. The next presentation will be held by Professor Dr. Salvatore Luca Losico about national identity in fashion, China, an exploration of the concept of country of region made in China and its connotations among Generation Z. Luca Losico, MBA, PhD, currently lives in Hong Kong where he teaches fashion marketing and management. Previously, he was in Atlanta, USA, as professor and associate chair and at SCAD University. Dr. Losico has lived in London for more than 16 years, where he was course director of two MA in fashion businesses at University of the Arts London. He has a wide international experience, having taught in several countries such as New Zealand, France, and Italy. Before starting his academic career, Dr. Losico has worked in the fashion industry for companies such as Gucci, Valentino, Fendi, and so on. His publications and articles center in his research interests, which include the evolution of luxury brand management and the development and application of teaching models to improve creativity in academic environments. Salvatore Luca Losico will present his contribution on the theme National Identity in Fashion China, an exploration of the concept of country of origin made in China and its connotations among Generation Z. Welcome. Can, can you hear me? Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. So, so, perfect. So I, I want to start saying that this study on Chinese national fashion identity started from a constant desire of mine to constantly implement inquiry, teaching and learning. So the opportunity came when the, uh, the opportunity came with uh, the exhibitions at the Hong Kong Museum of Arts uh, about uh, the road to the Baroque, the Capodimonte Museum collection. And uh, for me, the opportunity was uh, exceptional because under the same roof, we had the Western and East cultures because we managed to visit. I, br I, I brought my students over there. We managed to see the, the Western uh, uh, artifacts, but also the permanent collections uh, that obviously involved about uh, imperial China, painting, calligraphy, uh, landscapes, and so on. So we had uh, the opportunity to look at both uh, sides. Th the visit was preceded by a presentation of my own the notion of luxury in the East and West society in the 18th and 19th centuries. Then a questionnaire was handed to 140 fashion and fashion business students of Poly U, the university where I'm teaching at currently, with the specific questions related to fashion uh, Chinese identity. Uh, in these studies, we used a social constructivist approach, which emphasized the interdependence of social and individual processes in the co-construction of knowledge with the goal of understanding learning with a social environment. Uh, 
using narrative inquiry as a selected methodology, I also decided to add the three interviews of key opinion leader to seek additional evidence leading to greater validity and reliability. Fashion has a key role in enabling Chinese Generation Z to construct and express their identities, especially in cities where they have the opportunity, as Barrett mentioned in his work, to mingle with crowds of strangers. Responses from the uh, questionnaires confirmed and uh, our feelings of a new Chinese more aware identity made of different fashion choices shaped by a rediscovering of its own multicultural heritage, cultural exchanges and international connections. As I mentioned uh, previously, the opportunity of visiting this uh, uh, this exhibition for me was exceptional, not only because we had we visit West and East at the same time, but also because there were, in response to the uh, Baroque exhibition, the museum organized and asked to three artists, as you can see here in the, in the slides, the three artists, to uh, have a modern contemporary interpretations of the exhibitions. So this just a positions of multicultural environment, uh, reinterpretations, re-analyzing uh, certain things for me was important and actually was extremely beautiful. And, and especially it helped a lot of the interaction after the on when we led the workshops with the students. Indeed, uh, the conversations led to uh, um, uh, focusing on reinvestment values and something that it would be interesting to discuss with you guys uh, in terms of uh, Eastern uh, Europe. Uh, European fashions, reinvestment values versus cliché, the, cl the cl cl cliché nature of made in, in China. In scrutinizing the cliché, I realized its ambiguity, which highlights the transnational connections with, within the labeling system. And two main key uh, elements uh, emerged transcultural dynamics that needs to be taken into consideration, and the friction that at the moment uh, uh, China is, uh, the fr cultural frictions that China is, is experiencing. So in the context of fashion, a respectful made in has a strong impact on its affiliations with national identity. From the research, most appealing tag uh, for, for my students, for them, uh, was made in Italy, ironically. Uh, I, I didn't plan, I didn't purpose, but this was what came out from the, from the research as synonymous of uh, luxury, while they still had the concept of made in China as a, a poor quality and cheaply manufactured. So for me, that's why also uh, the being having made in Italy and made in China yeah, under the same uh, roof, uh, the same museum for me was important because this would emerged during the class conversations. So uh, in my uh, so, while conducting these studies, uh, an, an experiment which I want to repeat this coming semester in order to have a, a full year investigations, I was asking myself, how can Chinese fashion identity be understood if Chinese identity is unclear? And also, can we speak... Uh, can we speak of cultural heritage and creativity with China collectively? You know, we can, can we generalize? Can we say one thing? Well, we can't. Transnational and transcultural exchange are the foundation of contemporary China. Following the decade-long cultural revolutions came the lifting of 
uh, travel ban. So from Taiwan and Hong Kong travelers to main uh, China, to mainland China in the in the 80s. As a result of the lifting, Taiwanese and Hong Kong travelers learn about contemporary China first hand, but they also thought the Chinese much about contemporary lifestyle, quickly embraced by Chinese people. This intense interaction led in 1993 to mainland, mainland sorry, China's first fashion week in Beijing. Also, this transcultural exchange has cultivated China's contemporary lifestyle and popular culture. So what emerged in early discussion were two main key focus. The first one was that gener Generation Z clearly distanced themselves from the government, from politics, from the communist regimes. They don't associate themselves with that, but rather they prefer to uh, embrace uh, China as a place, race and civilizations. And then the second point that emerged was the heterogeneity of Chinese cultures, ancient and contemporary expressions, multiple contradictions and repetition on histories engendered by art and fashions. During the research, two main key items emerged that the Generation Z embraced, uh, and I experienced also in the street, uh, in class with my students, but also some of my colleagues, uh, they tried to reinterpret this kind of uh, garments in a very creative way, in a very contemporary way, even using knitwear or other uh, type of uh, fabrics. One is the magua jacket that you see here in the slides. Uh, in, if you look at the, the, in the picture in the middle, it's a short, traditionally, the heritage jacket is a, a shortened jacket with five buttons and wide sleeves. Why, obviously, in the contemporary way, is worn and reinterpreted with this multicultural exchange um, uh, happening. For girls, uh, uh, what emerged was the use of pleated skirts. Uh, in particular, this one from the Han, from the Cantonese regions that was worn on formal occasions together with trousers and jackets. This kind of uh, style, let's put it this way, of this kind of reinterpretation, I also experienced in class on the streets uh, and among my uh, peers and colleagues that I uh, work with. And this, uh, 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 in a certain way, confirmed the phenomenon of TikTok, Instagram, Chinese street styles. Oh, sorry, the slides went a little bit off. Uh, that we see and everyone is talking at the moment. You know, there is a famous uh, article in the Esquire magazine in 2020. And it's really uh, something that uh, we can, uh, I can see on the streets. Um, today, the political tension between China and the two Chinese regions, Hong Kong and Taiwan, is creating further conflicts and discomfort. The phrase made in China has entered a new phase of geopolitics, particularly reflective in the notion of Chinese identity. This has created a rupture with the notion of Chinese identity, particularly for the Chinese outside the, uh, the People's Republic of China. Despite the cultural and social relevance to some, many have viewed it with suspicion and skepticism. Uh, this has led those with the Chinese descent to simultaneously mobilize and dissolve their Chinese identity. And this kind of embracing heritage and culture, uh, Chinese culture, has clear evidence in uh, the, the way how uh, millennials and Generation Z wears. You know, we see, I, or, or what I, my personal experience and uh, living here and also through this study uh, shows uh, that, uh, for example, millennials embrace more 
European uh, brands and wears uh, uh, labels from top to toe, while Generation Z are looking for niche local uh, brands. And we'll, I will show you a couple of examples in a minute. Obviously, the pandemic has exacerbated the problem further. So I just want to show you, I don't know if we, I don't think we can see this. There was a, a short video of a, a TikTok of a, guys uh, walking through this kind of reinterpretation of contemporary heritage, Chinese heritage, embracing cultural uh, through fashion. Um, I also, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I had a conversation with uh, key opinion leaders that you see mentioned here in the slides. And what emerged was uh, uh, through the, this conversation was that China is clearly a diverse composition of many cultures that all seek to respond to a decide to partake in the global agenda. And this is something that, for example, the Slavic fashion that we were this, uh, I was listening before the presentations is something that I feel they should also uh, be part and, and try to have a stronger desire to uh, partake in the global agenda, the in, the, in the global conversation. The interaction of local and global forces with respect to cultural norms and values is constantly mutating in the trans-global landscapes. Uh, from both answers and discussions, a different set of value systems needed has emerged. While the heterogeneity of culture, heritage, and creativity may be acknowledged, those from a different cultural background are also part of the contemporary reality in China, what they call the others. We have to look at China and Chinese identity as a space of connections. And this is what really both uh, uh, Blondie and Tracy uh, mentioned in their uh, conversations, in their presentations. So uh, as I promised, uh, I wanted to give an, a, a couple of examples. This uh, Kenny Wong, that is a retail owner that created his own retail brand and launched his own brand called Growth Ring and Supply. He decided to create a reversible jacket mini capsule collection, collaborating with Jerry Kung, that is uh, ironically uh, taking in consideration the history of the relationship between job and China, uh, you know, we all remember the troubles during the Second World War, uh, Jerry Kung, that where uh, he, uh, they created this j reversible jacket uh, uh, with the, the dragons. But what most uh, in intrigued me of uh, this brand, and in particular his owner, Kenny Wong, was the his vision, his uh, uh, brand vision that really reflects the cultural and the uh, feelings uh, and the mood of the contemporary fashion identity in the new generations. And in particular, if you look at uh, what he writes uh, here about uh, his, uh, in his uh, website, we can see not only the new concept, what in Western we call the new concept of luxury, made of authentic aesthetic, uh, um, you know, made by hands, uh, uh, attachment, emotions. We all remember Roberts talking about love marks rather than brands, and um, and the attachment of nature, observation of nature, something that we experience in the landscape uh, exhibitions in the museum that is part of the, the observing nature is part of the artistic uh, experience, feelings of uh, uh, historically and contemporary as well of uh, China. So, and uh, um, he's also here, in, uh, he reinforced his uh, concept of new luxury he says, pursuing something that has value, preserving tradition, including handmade cultural crafts, building foundation and craftsmanship and story. And this is something that uh, 
I, I, I'm really happy that I'm, I'm mentioning these things because they are so, in a certain way, related to what you all were mentioned and saying before, uh, before my presentation. So, um, and uh, with this, I would like to conclude that, that uh, so far, my uh, what I what I can say is that the heterogeneity of Chinese cultures ancient and contemporary expressions, multiple contradictions and repetition of history is engendered both in art and fashions. Just as there was no Chinese nation state before the 20th centuries, indeed, as we know, we have, and this is something that also came out during the research and the, the discussion, the workshops that follow the visits and the questionnaires, we have 56 officials ethnicity uh, in China with each one uh, with their own cultures, traditions and differences. Uh, uh, transnational fashion narratives uh, are embraced by the Generation Z as emerged from the study. As China and the rest of the world cannot be taken, analyzed or discussed separately, the new contemporary fashion identity is what I, I suggest is a transformation in progress made by international connection and heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. So if you agree, I would like to give you some short questions for the debate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so after a visit to the Hong Kong Museum of Art Exhibitions, which we have seen, a questionnaire followed by a workshop with 140 fashion generation Z students, a forum was held to question the associations they have about a concept of made in China. So Generation Z, also called Gen Z, Zoomers, I generation, Senentials, post-millennials, or homelanders born between 1997 and 2012, is known as the most photographed generation, and it is said that Generation Z is more self-conscious in terms of their fashion and its environmental impact than other generations. Would you agree with that? Or should I say, what are the main characteristics of this generation Z. Well, I I, I absolutely agree. You know, there is an, um, there, is, there was a, a, while we were visiting. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I was saying that uh, while uh, we were visiting, the main uh, the main action, the main interaction for them th with the. With the with the arts, the crafts, the 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 different rooms was an opportunity for them to take a picture. So that's it's absolutely an element of their characteristics. In terms of what I experience during the studies, that I I can see that they have a clear identity they really uh, separate themselves from politics they are not very much engaged in politics but rather in in uh, rediscovering their roots they uh, the the before the let's say the communist era uh, one of the, I, I i i was quite surprised uh, happily surprised to discover that some of the major uh, TV uh, program uh, followed by the generations that are the new, uh, uh, but they are all no South Korean production. Uh, the new historical uh, movies about uh, China, ha how it used to be. And then they try to remake uh, and re uh, recreate some of what they see and they in this uh, 
very well loved uh, TV series uh, because that's what they are uh, in in their everyday clothes. So uh, this is very hopeful. This generation is very hopeful that this label made in China, which became a stigma, uh, that this stigma would eventually fade away. Yes, they they are. Uh, the, there, what we don't know yet uh, in the West, uh, in Europe or in the States and so on, uh, is that there are actually, I'm discovering, I'm discovering every day uh, new brands, uh, new fashion designers, local fashion designers and local fashion brands, that uh, they have a completely different approach uh, compared to previous ones. Those ones that, for example, they were just uh, re replicating the Western collections or copying uh, the Western collection. They have a completely new um, approach in, uh, in their design process that uh, include the, really the uh, revaluing their heritage. And, uh, I, 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 and also... What I found really interesting that they have uh, this um, from a managerial point of view because uh, uh, this uh, what I teach I, I, I teach mainly marketing and management and uh, and sociology of fashion as well. The uh, what I experience is really that they they are kind of like preparing their army to invade the the West with these new brands. They are not well known or completely unknown in, in Europe or in the States, in the Western world. Uh, but they are really kind of spending time refining their aesthetic in, in, a, in a way that reflect this new contemporary Chinese fashion identity that is, as I mentioned before, a mix of multicultural exchanges and heritage. And my last question, people really enjoyed products from China. They viewed projects such as tea, furniture, dishware as unique. It was a quality product and there was a cultural value. But when China became a world factory and produced so many items for so many brands, people changed their view views. Why? Yeah, this is this is something that I also uh, I was surprised that my students didn't were fully aware, as we know, and that's why uh, I did a presentation on on the notion of luxury in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, in West and East. They they were not aware of the fact that actually before the the max productions and before these recent changes in the western world having something from china was the the most luxurious things that you could possibly have in, if we go around in europe there are so many so many uh, palaces or villas from the aristocracy and the nobility and so on that they have uh, even dedicated uh, rooms, all decorated in what used to uh, uh, be called a chinoiserie, means uh, inspired by uh, China. It wasn't really uh, uh, accurate, but it was uh, um, an inspiration uh, of China, of what Asia looked like to the Western world. So this is, was really a surprise for them and for myself, understanding that they didn't uh, realize that. They thought that uh, China was always uh, commerce, uh, uh, mass productions, even in the exhibition, because there is a, a, a specific exhibition in, in that I don't know if you can see, uh, uh, let me, uh, there was an, a, a specific exhibition about, uh, oh, sorry, um, um, called a shopping, a shopping paradise where uh, it was an interactive um, an interactive uh, exhibitions uh, ideal for younger generations and uh, uh, children uh, where clearly 
was presented the, the fact that, uh, yes, they were producing, they were uh, uh, commercializing their, uh, their product, but actually their product had an intrinsic value uh, of uh, high uh, standard uh, that they didn't felt. The only thing that they noticed was commerce, the money, the value, the, uh, how many they will sell, how much the price. They always were uh, keen to look into the economic aspect uh, rather than the nature of uh, uh, and the essence of the of the products, the artifact and the value, the intrinsic value of the of the Chinese uh, products that we saw. So this is is a kind of a, a difference that I also noticed because in the Western we, I, I feel European. I always say, "Where are you from?" I'm European. Uh, we European, when we we like beauty, we see beauty, we admire beauty, and we appreciate beauty first of all. Then perhaps on a second step, we look at the, the economical side of what we are doing. But uh, for them, it's the other way around. They immediately look at uh, the economic aspect. They want to understand the, the economic value and then the, their appreciations and their additional values that a, 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 an artwork uh, uh, em, implies. Thank you very much for this lovely conversation on such an interesting view of this topic. Wishing you all the best on your professional path. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for thank having you. me. And I hope to see you soon, all of you, in person. Yeah, we too. We too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Now I would like to welcome our last participant of today's symposium, Assistant Professor Dr. Iva Jastritijevic, who will present us with the theme of sustainology, sustainology and anti-consumption rhetoric, fashion and consumer-resistant identities. Welcome. Aha, uh -huh. oh, uh, I'm sorry. TV. Uh, assistant Professor Dr. Iva Jastritijevic is currently an Assistant Professor in Merchandising and Digital Retailing at the University of North Texas, Denton, U.S. Her research is focused on sustainability and transformative, cooperative, collective and personal behavior. Her academic mission is to challenge the status quo in fashion industry practice contributing to a transformative implementation of its sustainability agenda, which should help improve the way we source, produce, promote, package, use, and reuse apparel and textiles. The second, but certainly not less significant research that Eva has pursued is grounded in the interdisciplinary domain of social psychology and cultural anthropology of dress and body, with the focus on the body, identity, appearance, and culture. Eva Estrinjevic will present her contribution on the research topic of sustainability and anti-consumption rhetoric, fashion, and consumer-resistant identities. Dear Eva, welcome. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we do. Okay, my connection is a little bit unstable, so please just interrupt it if you cannot hear me, but I hope everything will be good. Okay, so. Yes, I'm really honored to be here, honestly, because um, yes, I'm currently living in States. Actually, I live here the last eight years, but originally I'm from Balkan region, more precisely, I'm from Serbia. And I'm really familiar with everything you're doing over there. Um, so I wish I was able to come in person, but unfortunately this time we are meeting online. So thank you again. Uh, yes, last eight years I was exploring mainly sustainability and um, specifically sustainable consumption and production in fashion industry. And here at University of North Texas, previously I was employed at Ohio State University. Um, I was researching uh, consumer movements that are happening in the recent um, 
past here in America. So this presentation will really mainly apply to U.S. context. Uh, so what is systemology? If I want to provide just basic uh, explanation of this term, I would say that this is not the term that officially exists, but I'm uh, proposing it as really um, needed term to explain uh, one social and ideological movement that I can see um, uh, that was forming in the recent uh, history, American history as uh, opposition to uh, consumption and uh, more precisely overconsumption in the fashion industry that we can really track in the last two decades. So I will really try to be brief and leave enough space for questions. So uh, I have a next slide. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to change the slides or you, but let me try. Okay, so here is a short outline. So first, I will just briefly explain what I refer by using the term sustainability and uh, opposition to consumerism. And next, I would like briefly to talk about anti-consumption movement and its roots in America. And after that, I will explain why I think that context of pandemic and post-pandemic is I ideal space to explore anti-consumption. And uh, lastly, but not less important, I will be talking uh, briefly about my current research that is really focused on uh, sustainable lifestyle in the fashion industry. Uh, and, and that lifestyle is emerging among fashion activists. So if uh, we are thinking about um, uh, fashion industry, I'm sure you know that impact of the fashion industry is enormous. And um, uh, if you are thinking about uh, fashion from an ideological perspective, we can say that fashion is really um, one paradigm where things are used and discarded very soon. Uh, so it means that it's if you want to visualize uh, fashion as an ideological system, I would say that there is a linear line where things are produced, they are used, and they are quickly discarded. And if you are thinking about last, let's say, maybe three decades, uh, we can see these short, very short micro trends where things are just trendy or fashionable for a week. And we can see that growing number of fashion retailers are promoting a weekly trends. So on an annual level, we can track almost 52 micro trends and um, especially Gen Z consumers and uh, Dr. Luca was uh, really presenting um, great things about Gen Z uh, consumption methods. So I really agree that they are consuming a lot and they're consuming fast. So whenever they're leaving home, they have a need to wear something new. So that's why we can really track overconsumption trends here in America. I was doing uh, recently one study called uh, Clothing Mountains among Gen Z consumers, where I was tracking what my students are purchasing and how quickly they're discarding. And I found that among 800 students, uh, the total investment in new fashion items during three uh, three months was 800,000 and they discarded every fifth fashion item they recently purchased and they were wearing new fashion items on average five times before they discard them. So that cycle is really vicious cycle where things are, as I said, source, produced, used and discarded. So very linear model. And then in opposition to that model, if you are thinking about sustainability as a as a science and philosophy and lifestyle of slow uh, and, and mindful consumption, we can say that that, in a visual sense, that cycle is really circular. So things are sourced responsibly, they are used, and then after the usage, they are reused. So we, we have that kind of closed loop system where things are constantly in the process of usage, uh, either for their primary purpose or uh, sometimes they can be repurposed or upcycled or recycled. So they get a new meaning, but still they are in the usage system. 
So what I see in the American market is really interesting fact that um, almost 25% of consumers are so-called sustainability supporters that live a really mindful lifestyle, which is, as one of the famous authors, uh, uh, Duan Algin said, uh, inwardly rich and outwardly poor. Uh, so not poor in a negative sense, but really frugal. Uh, so it means that those consumers really uh, maybe consume what they need as opposed to consumption that is based on desire, never ending desire. So um, anti-consumption movement in in uh, US is nothing new. We can track subcultural styles uh, uh, that emerge after the Second World War. And also in the recent history, we can track growing number of consumers that are boycotting fashion brands, that they are uh, part of what we call here cancel culture, and they are supporting mindful consumption, slow consumption, anti-consumption, or emancipating consumption, or sustainable consumption. There are so many terms that are used interchangeably, even though their meanings somewhat are different. So uh, there is a common characteristic among these emerging lifestyles uh, that we can, uh, and com one of the most common value is resilience resistance or these days of uh, uh, consumption. And I would say that uh, that uh, this resentment is both attitude and behavior because it's not just I prefer not to buy this jacket, but uh, I will not buy it in reality. So we can see that it is not just intent or attitude. It is also reflected in consumer behavior. So um, why some consumers opt out? There are multiple reasons, and I will be talking about them later on when I discuss my current study. But I just want to say that this anti-consumption uh, lifestyle or slower consumption uh, lifestyle is not easy to adopt because we are surrounded by stuff and uh, the marketing activities are really uh, forcing us to buy new things because we really need them. And, and many of the things we are purchasing every day are not really functional. So most of our, uh, uh, let's say, purchases uh, sometimes are uh, not based on our needs, but more on our wants, right? So how we can opt out? Uh, once Max Weber said, that um, this anti-consumption lifestyle can be just adopted by heroic individuals. And after doing this kind of research, I really agree because I had a chance to interview a lot of uh, fashion activists that adopted slow or anti-consumption lifestyle. So why pandemic is a perfect context to explore anti-consumption? Well, um, what I saw is that, and I assume in Europe is the same thing, that during the pandemic, uh, everything was really a challenge. Life as normal was challenged, right? And uh, consumers had a lot of time to, to really question what they want to prioritize. So we saw um, that... Uh, consumption overall decreased during pandemic. And uh, the same thing is happening now post-pandemic in America. We really see that uh, fashion brands are struggling to uh, maintain the same kind of, um, um, I would say, sales and monetary uh, values they got before, prior to the pandemic in 2019. So they are really struggling because consumers are not buying as much as they used to buy prior to the pandemic. Most of people uh, start working from home. They don't need maybe... A, to change dress so frequently. And also we can see that uh, during pandemic in particular, if you remember, stores were closed, fashion brands were canceling their orders. So there were simp simply scarcity of things and you cannot buy whatever you want because simply uh, it was not possible at that particular moment. So it did change consumer uh, uh, priorities, but also it did it did uh, the question the dominant uh, approach to consumerism. 
So uh, there is a really great theory called vol voluntary simplicity. I was using it to um, really as my theoretical uh, background to explain what is happening among these uh, sustainability supporters. And I really want just briefly to introduce this theory. So voluntary simplicity as a theory emerged in uh, 1980s and it was created by Dual Elgin. And uh, scholars are using this uh, theory Theory to explain some common values among uh, sustainability supporters. And these common values are really um, something that we can describe in the following way. So first thing is material simplicity. So people are intentionally deciding to consume less and to buy just what they need and not necessarily what they want. The second characteristic is human scale. So people, as Luca was uh, talking recently in, in, uh, in China context, uh, consumers are buying local products and they really want to uh, have interaction with, uh, with the seller. So they are really uh, slowing down their consumption and they're investing in things that are locally sourced, locally produced in order to uh, communicate their um, different identity that is formed in opposition to mainstream, let's say, fashion identity. And then the third characteristic is self-sufficiency. So uh, in a fashion context, it would be reliance on what we already own in our wardrobe. So we don't want to invest in new items. We will just use what we already own. Um, and then ecological awareness, I would say that this is really common characteristic among uh, sustainability supporters because they do have increased awareness about um, all problems that we are seeing in our in environment. Um, and, you know, you're familiar with uh, global warming and uh, all other lack of water uh, and pollution. So personal growth, uh, decision, intentional decision to invest in spiritual growth and not so much on material uh, possession or economic uh, growth. Uh, growth. And uh, research on voluntary simplicity is relatively new in American context, but there are groups, let's say, that are actively um, participating in cancel culture. So uh, I was mainly interesting because I'm part of remake fashion movement here in states. So these are fashion activists that are trying to challenge the, the, the change and support the change in the fashion industry. So I was exploring how they are actually trying to boycott Black Friday and what are their reasons not to consume things and not to purchase anything new during the Black Friday when there is really a um, force almost to buy new things because of huge discounts that are proposed by fashion retailers. So I was interviewing these uh, fashion activists that are uh, acting as a part of fashion uh, remake movement. And here are brief insights in uh, their thoughts. So I was asking them why they're not supporting uh, new uh, purchases, why they're against consumption. And here are some of their answers. I will not read them, but I will just summarize the main findings. So there are a couple of themes that emerge in the data. And the first one is perhaps the uh, feeling anxious about how much things are first placed place on the market and how much people are consuming, trying to fulfill their inner gap, uh, which cannot be fulfilled with material possessions. So as a consequence, consumers who are over-consuming were feeling empty. And um, that's why uh, people who are fashion activists and who support sustainability, they opt out of that system. The second thing that emerged in the data is that uh, people uh, from consumer perspective, um, they feel exploited by the fashion industry. So it means that they feel like a waste uh, and uh, until they have money, they are in the system. And then when they spend all their money, they exclude it. And then new consumers are used uh, uh, for the same purposes and uh, mainly for the purpose of profit generation. So uh, also uh, this consumers that decided not to consume new fashion products were talking about um, 
feeling uncomfortable uh, with um, living in, in, in a world of global capitalism. Um, they also feel like entitled to change something. So very often they were very active and even proactive in their intentions to change the dominant system of fashion. And um, uh, very often they are very expressive, so they're not hesitant to share how they and why they opted out. So if we want to describe them visually, because I did include the word rhetoric, and rhetoric is always manifestation on dominant ideology. So if we are thinking about, um, let's say, semiotic analysis of, of the garments that are worn by fashion activists and sustainability supporters, I would say that we can really roughly um, uh, categorize them in three groups. So the first one are thrifters. So these are uh, fashion supporters in a way that are very uh, much uh, committed to buy only already used garments, so nothing new. So they're not necessarily uh, against uh, consumption because they are, of course, still dress. Everyone is, right? But they are supporting slower consumption and mainly consumption of already produced garments. So they don't want to contribute to uh, to, to the debt uh, circle of vicious consumption where you are just buying constantly new items. The second group of uh, consumers are minimalistic consumers that are really curating their capsule wardrobes, I would say. Um, I was uh, conducting experiments with my students last three years, seeing what percentage of Gen Z students uh, is willing to wear capsule wardrobe during the school semester. And I was really surprised to see that almost like 30% of the students are really wearing their capsule wardrobes, which consist only of 30 garments. So this is what I mean by by uh, saying there is really trend of uh, minimalism among even fashion students, where again, students are opting out, uh, uh, making any new purchases, but they are making capsule wardrobe of clothing that they already own. And the last group that contain anti-fashion environmentalists that uh, really are uh, wearing only something that we can describe as uniform. Uh, I'm sure you remember um, uh, fashion anti-style, which we called anti-style that emerged in Russia, um, uh, where we saw and we can track utilitarian dress. Um, so I would say that these uh, anti-fashion environmentalists environmentalists, they are wearing that kind of uniform that is really functional and very often in just uh, include uh, simple jeans and the white t-shirt and a sweater. So nothing really uh, very loud uh, from um, a semiotic perspective. So very, very uh, decent colors and very simple uh, look. And uh, I would say that this kind of um, uh, fashion activist um, demonstration you can see all around U.S. and particularly on college campus. So uh, I don't know if this will remain uh, anti-consumerism and sustainability lifestyle will remain dominant just among 25 consumers, 25% of the consumer body, or it will increase in the future. But predictions are telling us that Perhaps there will be steady increase in consumers who support sustainable lifestyle. And we predict that that percentage on annual level will be somewhere around 5%. So we can say that this lifestyle is here to stay, at least in the States. This is the situation. And I will stop here. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, let you ask questions if you have any. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, lovely representation. Uh, so, criticism of consumerism is thus a critique of the accumulation of goods through desires that can never be realized, as you mentioned earlier, since the consumer pr pr process is nothing more than the production of ever new desires. Ultimately, therefore, such criticism is always neo-Marxist, in the sense of a false consciousness that produces false needs. So is consumerism a new form of economic exploitation? 
If I need to be blatantly honest, I would say yes, it is. Um, because um, consumerism is ideology, as we, we all know that, and those new needs are really produced um, and, and, and constructed. And as I said, I think that this kind of um, activism is really needed, at least among us who are employed in the fashion industry or fashion education, we do need to speak up and, and you know, just request at least a small change in the system, which is reason, really needed. Because if you think about fashion industry, there is so much dirt in there. And um, it is not just uh, environmental uh, exploitation, it is also social exploitation. I don't know how much you're familiar with the hidden supply chains that are actually um, hidden in the Balkan region. I didn't even know that, let's say, my country is um, um, producing garments for many luxury brands. And I was living there, I didn't even know that. So I would say that this system is really exploitative and um, uh, sustainable fashion is trying to challenge, question, and at least support some minor change in the system. Yeah. People all over the world have started demanding more of fashion. In recent years, unsafe working conditions in factories around the globe have provoked outrage and fashion revolution has us asking, who made my clothes? And brands have started to respond with corporate responsibility strategies in international commi commitments. Is fast fashion slowing down? <laughs> no, unfortunately, in speeding up. Um, uh, I was recently at the International Textile and Apparel Association Conference, which is the, the biggest conference in our field in America. And there was a presenter uh, I cannot say the name, but the person is a, a um, professor at one of the universities here in America, and the professor was uh, proposing the new concept of speeding up fast fashion. So not having weekly trends, 52 trends, uh, uh, micro trends per year, but having daily trends. And I was really... Um, very, very discouraged <laughs> with that proposal because yeah. uh, if you see that many people are seeing benefits which is endless and that are mainly profitable, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is so sad, right? Because then when we're going to stop with exploitation? Mm -hmm. And like you said, yes, living wages are still not achieved in, in major uh, countries that form a supply chain in the fashion system. And so many people are exploited for the sake of fashion, fast fashion mainly. So I do expect to see alternative. And here in America, there are so many local brands in China as well, I heard recently. So, and I suppose everywhere, that kind of local um, anti-movement is really obviously happening as alternative system of mainstream fast fashion. Mm -hmm. What about resale and rental and outlet stores? Is this a part of the solutions? Yes, absolutely. This is part of circular system where things are um, used after their primary lifestyle uh, life cycle. I'm sorry. Here is still early in the morning, so I'm not fully awake. Um, so yes, resell, reuse, repurpose, um, upcycling, recycling um, are all solutions to a problem. Because if you think about garments that are already produced, and never sold, this is around 30% of the things that are produced. So if we want to measure quantitatively overproduction, we can say that intentionally fashion retailers are creating 30% surplus. So these are things that are produced and they're never sold. So what we are doing with these items? Here in States, mainly brands are burning them uh, and and uh, some brands are having this secondhand or resale or outlets stores. Let's say Ellen Fisher, 
this is B Corp, they have um, a store called Renew where they are upcycling their unsold merchandise and they are reselling it. But this is a local B Corp corporation. What about mainstream retailers? Very often they are not uh, upcycling or reusing their items because they think they're going to dilute the, the brand aura. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna they're gonna discount their goods, so those goods will not be desired any longer. So unfortunately, we don't see so many um, resells happening here in America. And my last question: What does it mean to be responsible consumer? I think this is the question we should all ask ourselves. Uh, I know what it means to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I can just speak about myself here in this case. Uh, so I can say that um, I was really questioning a lot my purchasing habits and I was really trying to buy what I need. Uh, I have uh, luckily many fashion design students who are creating great things mm -hmm. and I like to purchase from them uh, and, and in that way you always have something unique uh, which is handmade and which is uh, really high in quality, very durable because in the mainstream fashion market you cannot find quality things any longer. Everything is so cheaply made that uh, of course students are discarding things too quickly because they cannot survive let's say three uh, drying processes in the in the clothing dryer. So I would say changing what we can change and questioning what we cannot. Thank you very much for this pleasant conversation on such an interesting and current topic. Wishing you all the best on your professional path. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would like to thank all the participants for their contributions on today's symposium. Thanks to the audience as well. And I would like to conclude. Clothes can carry many significant signs according to their shape, color, surface, decoration, embroidery, techniques, etc. And each one can be the expression of identity over ethnicity, religious beliefs, age, education, and social class. Through observation of clothing styles over these items, the assumptions could be made about a person's identity. Fashion and clothing is a field where clothes are used to create and reveal a cultural and social identity. And this point has been going on from ancient times, and it will also go on in the future too. Thank you again. Have a lovely day, a warm December, and a very kind new year. <laughs>